So a couple of days ago, OpenAI released a new model called O3, which many experts argue has finally achieved AGI or artificial general intelligence, which has always been the holy grail in the field of AI. It's when a computer surpasses the intelligence of the average person. According to some estimates, O3's IQ is equivalent to 157 IQ points, which places it in the 0.0075 percentile of the human population. Just for comparison, Einstein's IQ was reportedly 160, and as you can see, the average person ranges between 85 to 115 points, so this is kind of a big deal. So whenever a new AI model comes out, there's a bunch of benchmarks and evaluations that researchers do to determine its capabilities. It's no different than a student, right? When you go to school, you have geography, you have mathematics, and in each class, there's tests and assessments that your teacher does to basically determine how you stack up against everybody else. So AI models are no different, and there's a variety of different benchmarks out there, but the final boss of all benchmarks is Arc AGI, which is a test that differs in every other benchmark in two different ways. So number one, as the name implies, its purpose is to measure when an AI model has achieved artificial general intelligence. And it's different in the sense that in order to pass or thrive in this benchmark, the AI model must be able to pick up new skill sets. So just for reference, the average person scores 85% on the ARC AGI benchmark. And the best model that we've ever seen up until O3 has scored 55%, so a 30% gap. Now, O3 has officially scored 87.5%, but that's not even the craziest part, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So first, let's just kind of unpack this graph because there's a lot going on. Now, as you can see, there's two different types of models that are being tested that are represented by a different color. So the red ones are O1, or the predecessor, the older model before O3. And as you can see, there's multiple versions of each model. So each model has like a mini or a light version. They have the full-blown version. But as you can see on the graph, the O1 was scoring about 8%, and then the highest was hitting 32%. Now, this model was released just three months ago in September of 2024. And as you can see, even the lightest version of O3 is scoring at 75.7%, and the full-blown version is hitting 87.5%. Now, let's take some time and understand what the difference is between GPT and the O1 model lines. So at this point, I'm sure you've played around with ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, and all the other LLMs. And one thing you've probably noticed is that the minute you hit enter, it instantaneously starts spitting out an answer. It blurts out the first thing that comes to mind, which is, I mean, super impressive. But what makes the O1 and O3 models different, they use a new technique called chain of thought. And basically what that means is that they take their time to go over step by step the response they're going to give you before they blurt it out there. It's almost like double checking your work on a math problem. And the notable difference is that this takes time. It might take seven seconds. It might take two and a half minutes. And down the road, these models might even take up to weeks or even months to answer a sophisticated question. So for example, if you wanted to synthesize a brand new drug or go over thousands of pages of city infrastructure and make some modifications, these tasks may take weeks to, to actually compute and digest. So that's what fundamentally makes these O1 and O3 models different than ChatGPT. Somebody on Twitter asked the creator of the actual test, ArcAGI, when do you expect an AI model to solve the test? And this was his response. He said, fully solved, not within the next eight years, and 70% solved, hopefully less than eight years, perhaps four to five years. Now, mind you, the date of this tweet is December 1st, 2022, or almost exactly two years ago to the date almost. This puts his timeline at 70% solved to be 2026, 2027. Mind you, this is still December of 2024. So that should give you some context of how fast the whole field is advancing. Another tweet that I saw that caught my attention is the president of the ARC AGI Prize tweeted not only how surprised he was that the O1 model was able to score at, you know, 87%, but the simplicity of the prompt really shocked him. As you can see, the prompt to solve this problem was find the common rule that maps an input grid to an output grid. That's it. Now, if you've dabbled with, with AI, I'm sure you've noticed that some of the prompts are like mini essays and there's a whole art form to crafting these prompts, but it turns out like a simple sentence that's very straightforward, like go solve this problem, seem to do the trick, which is also incredibly shocking. So besides Arc AGI, OpenAI shared the results of a bunch of other evaluations they did as well. So for example, here's a software engineering bench where O3 scored 71%, whereas O1 scored 48.9. But more interestingly, Code Forces, which is a platform for competitive coding, O3 scored 2,727. Not only is that a jump from 1891 with O1, but that score is equivalent to the 175th best player on the platform. Now, what this means is there is less than 200 humans on the planet. 
that can code at this level on specific tasks. And to put it in other terms, this places O3 in the 99.95 percentile of all coders. It's currently ranked in the international grandmaster category in the next step, is the esteemed legendary grandmaster, which I'm sure we could expect future releases to match. Some of the other benchmarks are the AME 2024, which is a competitive math benchmark. The interesting thing here is that O3 only missed one question. On the PhD level science questions or the GPQA diamond, O3 placed 87.7%, which is a nice little jump from O1 at 78%. But I saved the craziest results for last. Frontier Math is a benchmark that consists of the hardest mathematical questions out there. Just for some context, the average person can solve 0% of these questions. Not only that, but if you took some of these problems and you gave them to the brightest mathematicians, it might take them hours or days to solve just one. Here's what Timothy Gowers has to say, who is a Fields Medal winner in mathematics. And just for context, once again, the Fields Medal is considered the Nobel Prize in mathematics. It is the absolute highest honor there is. He said, the questions I looked at were all not really in my area and all looked like things I had no idea how to solve. Now, before the O3 model, the state-of-the-art AI was able to get a whopping 2% correct. And here comes O3, blowing past it at 25.2%, which is hard to emphasize how crazy that is. Here's another tweet that quotes Terry Tao, one of the top mathematicians in the world, who said that these are extremely challenging. I think they will resist AIs for several years at least. And as you can see, the equations speak for themselves. And now let's get into one of the most interesting aspects, which is the economics. So even though O3 scored at 87%, and I think it spent 16 hours solving this data set, if I remember correctly, the interesting thing is that OpenAI spent thousands of dollars per task. And I heard the total test cost OpenAI $1.6 million. So I found this tweet where somebody ran a quick analysis. So you can see that the O1 model scored 32%, and this cost computationally $3 to achieve. Now, O3, the light version, for 20 bucks, was able to achieve 76%. For exponentially more, for $3,200, it was able to achieve only 9% better results. We're spending exponentially more money to get incrementally better results. Now, I fully expect this trend to decrease, and just like Moore's Law, the computational cost is going to come down. The $3,200 will soon be $320, and then another zero will drop, and before you know it, this will cost $3 in the near future. But also, this gives credence to the rumors that OpenAI was exploring a $2,000 per month plan. Now, just last week, they announced an O1 Pro plan for 200 bucks a month, but obviously $2,000 a month is a whole different ball game. And what that also tells me is that OpenAI is not really targeting individuals with $2,000. They're coming after companies. And more specifically, I think this almost indicates the first attack on human labor. Whereas a company might spend four, five, six, seven, eight thousand a month hiring contractors out of Eastern Europe and India, it seems like this is directly squared at those companies, painting O3 as a replacement to those workers, but time will tell. One thing is obvious and certain, which is the progress of AI is going to keep exponentially increasing. Mind you, O1 was released three months ago. So as you can see in this chart, GPT-2 and 3 didn't even make a dent. GPT-4 kept getting better, and O1 was really that groundbreaking innovation that enabled this massive takeoff that we're witnessing now with O3. Here's another chart that shows you that ARC AGI scores year over year. Five years ago, we were scoring at zero, and all of a sudden now we're blowing past 85%. So it's pretty obvious that in the next couple of years, 100% will absolutely be achieved. And on the topic of progress, here's a tweet from an OpenAI employee who says, Today we announced O3. We have every reason to believe that this trajectory will continue. So now let's get into the controversial part of this conversation. A lot of experts, including ironically the creator of the ARC AGI prize, are refuting the claim that this is truly AGI. This is a quote straight from their website, which says that ARC AGI serves as a critical benchmark. However, it is important to note that ARC AGI is not an acid test for AGI. Then they go on to say that we're going to be raising the bar with a new version, ARC AGI 2. It will be useful and extremely challenging, even for O3. Going forward, the ARC Prize Foundation will continue to create new benchmarks to focus the attention of researchers on the hardest unsolved problems on the way to AGI. So this I find mildly annoying because this is the definition of shifting the goalpost. To me, they're saying this is the benchmark for AGI. 
an AI model actually gets really close to solving it and then they come up with a new benchmark and they keep shifting it higher and they're actually open about it. They're saying they're going to keep doing this until AGI is finally reached. But that begs the question, what is AGI really? AGI is a term to me is kind of dumb because general intelligence is not really being tested in any one of these metrics. All of these tests are testing for language, coding, mathematics, and engineering, the STEM fields, right? But if this is truly a general intelligence benchmark, why isn't it testing for musical intelligence? How come creating a melody isn't part of the test or replicating a tempo, designing a logo, creating a, an aesthetically pleasing photograph? Those things are equal part intelligence. So what's really happening is we're biased and constrained to quantitative tests because we can measure those. But take, for example, LeBron James. This guy is clearly in possession of some higher order intelligence when it comes to basketball. He has some sort of spatial intelligence. He seems to know where everybody is on the court at all times. He has this crazy memory that he can recall games earlier. He has kinetic intelligence, how to move his body in such a way to throw off his opponents. He has temporal intelligence with timing, strategy planning. But if LeBron James took the IQ test and he scored a 90, would you call him dumb? That clearly doesn't prove that he's not intelligent in other areas. So IQ and intelligence in general seem to be biased towards a very, very specific type of intelligence, which we're calling general. I think that is the problem. We should be more open to the creative aspects and the creative intuition of these models. And I get it, right? It is hard to quantify what a good photograph is. It's hard to judge if a logo is great or if it sucks. It's very subjective. But ultimately, I kind of use this heuristic where if experts can decide if it's AGI, it probably is. For example, if you take who are the top five rappers of all time, nobody would argue that Nelly or Ludacris is in the top five, right? That gets dismissed instantly. If a conversation or a debate persists long enough, there's merit to it by default. If we're still debating if Jadik is the top five or Nas, chances are they probably are, right? To me, AGI, even if the definition is imperfect and fuzzy, we're clearly hovering near that territory of artificial intelligence. Now, what does this mean? Let's take some time and speculate about the future because there's a few takes I want to cover. One of the quotes I read by Sam Altman a couple of months ago really stuck with me. He said, when AGI is achieved, it will come and pass and nobody would really care. And the longer I thought about that quote, the more I agreed with it. So right now, AGI is like trapping the smartest person in history inside of a cage at the zoo. You can give them a test, they solve it, we all applaud, and we go on about our day. And the reason the world doesn't feel like it has changed much fundamentally is because that person doesn't have access to the real world to economically impact it. So for example, if you take Elon Musk and you trap him in a room and there's no internet, there's no TV, no communication devices, you can ask him and shout any questions about engineering rockets and he'll give you the answer. And we can all be amazed at his intelligence, but ultimately he's powerless. There's not much he can do. So the way I envision AI is best communicated with this matrix that I came up with. So the Y axis is the intelligence and the X axis is the ability and autonomy of these agents. So in the lower left hand quadrant, we have LLMs like ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, etc. The quadrant above that is when we have the more advanced reasoning models like the O1s and O3s and whatever comes next. But the X axis is the ability for those models to perform actions. So the lower right hand quadrant is maybe tasks. And actually, there is a leak of an upcoming ChatGPT feature called Tasks. So I'm guessing this will be shipped out. And the quadrant above that is maybe entire workflows. So instead of performing individual tasks, you can string those together to perform an entire workflow. The level above that, in my mind, would be management or the ability for a single agent to manage other agents or people that are performing these workflows and tasks and essentially enable entire organizations that are run by AIs. Now, from the looks of it, 2025 is definitely going to be the year of the AI agents. I think OpenAI and all the other frontier labs are going to be releasing agent capable models in 2025 that can either take over your mouse and keyboard, perform some sort of a task, or maybe do it autonomously in the cloud. But whatever the case is, we're in for a crazy ride. Let me know what you think down in the comments and until next time.